Well, welcome. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here today. We uh, had a couple of people tell us where they're from and um, all over the country and outside of the country. So uh, a warm still point center of spiritual development, welcome to you. The great soul Mahatma Gandhi said, the golden way is to be friends with the world and to regard the whole world, the whole human family as one. And today we're really blessed, really, really blessed to have a spiritual midwife with us who speaks the language of oneness so fluently. And that's Joyce Rupp. Um, I imagine most of you here today know Joyce, uh, but she's a prolific author. She is the founder and teacher of the Boundless Compassion Program. And everything she does uh, from her, her view of God, her view of um, our goodness, uh, the goodness of creation, um, she'll tell you that most of that has its roots in her childhood. Um, she was born and raised on a farm in Iowa, and she'll get into that more. But Joyce, we are so blessed to have you here with us today. Thank you so much. We also have joining us Will Rucker. Will is a local. Uh, he's here in Las Vegas. He is a spokesperson for Compassionate Las Vegas, our sponsor today. It's helped us um, come together. And Will is a regional nonprofit director. He is a, a, a leadership coach. Um, he also, uh, at a point in his life, has uh, sung opera, which is pretty exciting. Uh, when Will is with his clients, he often asks the question, what is your relation? What is your relational superpower? And Will's is compassion. So Will, thank you for joining us today. When we get started, um, we'll have about 55 minute conversation between Will and Joyce on compassion, the science of compassion, and in the shifting world, what we're called to, the higher consciousness we're called to, um, and that courageous compassion that we're being called to in this time. But first, I'd like to begin with a still point tradition. And that tradition is kind of checking in and spending some quiet time in contemplation. Um, but if you would, take a moment to get comfortable where you are, in your body, in your chair, on your mat, wherever you are. And if you can, ground your feet to the floor. Lower your gaze or close your eyes. Allow yourself to take a few deep breaths to deeply relax as we listen to the words of Sarah Thompson's By Breath. It's one of Joyce's favorite songs. By breath, by blood, by body, by spirit, we are all one. By breath, by blood, by body, by spirit, we are all one. The air that is my breath is the air that you are breathing, and the air that is your breath is the air. Oh 
Rushing the river, running stream By breath, by blood By body, by spirit We are all one By breath, by blood and take a moment to rejoin us. And it's my pleasure now to invite Will to begin our conversation with spiritual midwife, Joyce Rupp. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shana. And good morning, good afternoon, good day to each and every one of the nearly 250 people joining us live for this collaboration with Compassionate Las Vegas and Still Point Spiritual Center. This is something that we're going to record for our podcast. So if you're not already subscribed, go ahead and visit Compassion.Vegas and become a subscriber of the podcast. We have nearly 100 episodes that you can enjoy. So thank you, Shana, again for this wonderful occasion. My name is Will Rucker, and I am so excited to be with this spiritual, compassionate powerhouse, Joyce Rupp. Good morning, good afternoon. Hello, Joyce. Hello, Will. I am so excited to be here. I'm just thrilled to have this connection with you and um, just ready to go. So um, Wonderful. Well, I have to just say that I have been enjoying your work since we were introduced and the more I get of it the more I want it is just so rich and so eye-opening there is a true paradigm shift that you discuss and the way that you bring this through the lens of Christianity is simply beautiful and I hope that this message continues to plant seeds in each and every one of our hearts and that they blossom and form into action. So I wanted to start with a real simple question, which is, can you just define compassion for us as our foundation for today? Oh, yeah. You know, there's so many definitions of compassion. And um, I think my my own, as I, I kind of stumble around with it, but I always say that compassion is about awareness, first of all. It's an awareness of suffering. And then it's my attitude toward those who are suffering that I, I understand that we are one, that we're not independent from each other. So compassion is an awareness of suffering. It's an attitude that we are one. And then it's an action that I want to alleviate or lessen that suffering. So that's, that's basically what I, would, what I would consider compassion. And I always want to add with that, Will, that compassion isn't isn't necessarily a feeling because I think people get concerned, you know, that, gosh, I'm not feeling compassionate, but it's more than that. I I think it's uh, Christina Feldman who says, compassion is an understanding. It's understanding um, how or where that, or why that that suffering is in another person's life. So um, just wanted to add that, so. Wow, I, I, I love that. It's not just a feeling because sometimes you're right. I absolutely don't feel 
compassionate. Uh, How did you get acquainted? When did you first develop this interest in compassion? Wow, that's such a great question, Will, because, you know, I, I think especially now that I have white hair, I can look back and I have a lot of stepping stones, but I, I always marvel at how did I get to be here today, you know, and so I entered my own religious community um, and the one of the first things that I learned is that our, our dedication or our central uh, devotion was that to Mary standing at the foot of the cross, that we were to be with people that were suffering. You know, we didn't, I don't think we even used the word compassion then. It wasn't, I think, part of our vocabulary that much. Um, but so I immediately was kind of immersed in that sense of whatever service I gave, I was to be aware of people who were suffering. And to be there and with that spirit of standing, you know, uh, accompanying them. So that, you know, and I think I, I thought about compassion. I know I thought about compassion mostly as an act of kindness when I was young. And then I was, it was the mid 80s. And the first book that I read about Christianity and compassion came from Henry Now and then two of his colleagues, and it was just called Compassion. And that book just blew me away because I thought, wow. I mean, he was really naming um, not just how Jesus was compassionate, but a lot of the layers and connections with um, Christianity and compassion. So that was there. And then in the mid nineties, um, this was a real turning point for me. I decided to study transpersonal psych, do some graduate work. And so I went to, there are only two places. And again, I always think it's amazing how we're led synchronistically, but so I went to Boulder, Colorado to Naropa University, which is a Buddhist university. And uh, I went really to study psychology, but I ended up a lot of my, my several years there were studying Buddhism. And I had not a clue that Buddhism was so focused on suffering and compassion. Um, I read everything I could. I had some teachers, you know, who were Buddhists who were teaching about compassion. And so that was a real turning because I learned then that um, Compassion is really about a way of life. It's more than an act of compassion. It's my whole inner posture is first most vital. And then how does that lead me then to those that, that are suffering? So that was, you know, and then I came, I returned back to Des Moines and um, I was continuing doing work retreats and conferences and workshops. But I, I kept reading and resourcing. And it was in the early, I just the other day I checked this in, but it was in the early 2000s that suddenly this was this plethora of books and uh, all kinds of resources on compassion from a science perspective, uh, quantum physics and uh, neuroscience and how they could help us in being compassionate. Wow, I thought, you know, so it's a long story, but I'm getting there. <laughs> So, so in 2007, I can still see where I was standing. I'm reading, I'm reading this magazine and it was advertising this workshop with the Dalai Lama teaching families how to be compassionate. And I thought, who's teaching Christians how to be compassionate? I don't, I don't see anything around, you know? So that, that I thought, well, maybe, maybe I could do that with what I've been learning and so that was the whole beginning then of the Boundless Compassion Program and um, did some more research and, and, and it's just kept developing since then. And so, so that's, that's how, I mean, isn't it amazing how those, I mean, each of us have our own story and our own journey and how we get to be at the place we're at. But I, I love thinking about that. Who isn't that amazing? I never dreamt I'd be here in this point today. So thank you. Absolutely. No, spirit guides us and directs us, sometimes even without <laughs> us being conscious or aware that we're being directed. I, I really find two things fascinating. Well, I mean, the entire story is fascinating, but these two things in particular, the connection with science, but also the, the thought you had that someone needs to teach Christians to be compassionate. And the reason I say I find that really fascinating is because the Christ, Jesus, is the total embodiment of compassion and every there he absolutely had the compassionate acts but he lived a compassionate life the very essence of everything he did 
was compassion. So to me, that says there's a huge overlap with Christianity and Buddhism. Do you see some of that as well? Oh, you know, I that was part of what really astounded me when I started studying Buddhism. And I thought, wow, there's so many parallels here. You know, I think starting with that, you know, Buddhism starts kind of the foundation is the law of one is what they would call it. You know, that we're interconnected. We're not separate beings. And when I when I came across that, I thought of that, you know, Matthew 25, which is where Jesus says, this is this is what's most vital in your life. And that is, you know. Um, when you do, you know, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the imprisoned, then he, he concludes and says, when you did it to them, you did it to me, you know, so it's that, it's that same thing, it's that law, that law of one, and, um, and I, another thing that really struck me is, you know, Jesus so often says, you know, stay awake, be alert, and for Buddhism, mindfulness is so key, you know, that awareness that, that needs to be there, Um as you know, and, and this I was reflecting on this morning, knowing we were, were going to do this podcast, and I thought, well, how could I have forgotten this? But one of the touching quotes in Nouwen's book, um, he's talking about the compassion of Jesus. And then he's talking about this, how Jesus personified the divine. Um, you know, the, he helped us see who this divine being is. And the quote is something like this. Um, God is the one who goes to the most forgotten corners of the world and will never rest as long as there are human beings with tears in their eyes. And I thought of Kuan Yin, who one of my favorite images of this Buddhist bodhisattva is this huge ear leaning over to hear the cries of suffering in the world. And I thought of I thought of the parallel of, of those two and, and how beautiful that is. Um, but, you know, there, there are many, um, many parallels. And, and Will, you're so right, because, you know, the Gospels are filled with compassion. And I, I just thought it was astounding that no one was talking about it, you know. And, and, um, and I'm so glad that you mentioned Jesus as being the embodiment of compassion, because he truly is. So, yeah. You remind me of First John, the fourth chapter, where it's written that God is love. Ah. And whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And that to me is that principle of oneness again mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. highlight. So there, there are just so many different connections. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for re reminding me of that because that is that's another beautiful connection. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So I want to move to something called the four C's of compassion. And I just want to know, why did you pick these four, four C's? Uh -huh. Well, first of all, the metaphor of seed, I was glad that Shauna mentioned my, my roots, <laughs> another connection with nature. But, um, you know, I, I've been fascinated with seeds ever since I was young. And um, the potential in a seed like I would see my dad go out and plant the fields and I'd be astounded when harvest came and how much could come from those fields and so when I started thinking about um, what are the basic aspects or components of compassion I thought I thought a seed because all the researchers today say that we are born um, with the capacity for compassion that that's inherent in all of us Sometimes something happens, you know, early on that thwarts that ability to be compassionate, but we all have that, that we're born with that capacity. So then I, I started again looking at both Buddhism and Christianity, and I found constant parallels. I thought, you know, Buddhism is all about accepting people as they are and not judging. Of course, I thought of Jesus, do not judge and you will not be judged. And and then, and so I did, so non-judgment was the first one, I think. And for me, that was just so key because how I am with another person, if I'm not thinking they have to match up to my ideals and my beliefs and my approach to life, if I can accept them as they are, that's that's got to be there as foundational for compassion. And then the but before mm -hmm. we move to the next one, yeah. accepting someone as they are, can you just expound on that a bit? I know in my journey, that is still one of the areas that I wrestle mm -hmm. with navigating because I'm compassionate. And yeah. so some of this compassion leads me to want to change or fix. And so mm -hmm. I have to be very intentional and mindful about acceptance. So could you speak more to that? 
Yeah. You know, I'll give you an example of that. Um, I can give you a lot of examples of my life, <laughs> probably from yesterday. But, you know, uh, when COVID first happened and we were masked up outside and that, I... I make a point every day of going for an hour walk and I walk around this one lake that I like is beautiful path. And I, I couldn't believe so many people weren't wearing masks. And I found myself getting more and more angry. I'd come home and I'd be fuming about all these people that didn't wear a mask, you know? And um, finally one day I just sat with myself and I thought, you know, I'm judging every person who doesn't wear a mask is a terrible person, and uncaring and all of that. And so I thought I've got to, I've got to change that. And so for me, the way I do that is I go, I try to go deeper and I think, you know what, that person isn't a bad person. That person has chosen not to wear a mask for some reason. And, and so I know if deep down we are more alike than different. And that person wants happiness and that person, you know, has struggles and all of that. So, so that really helped me. But the other thing I did is I took action and I started walking on different paths. So I wouldn't have all that anger. I love <laughs> but, that. Yeah. But, but that's the kind of struggle, you know, that's there. And, um, Christina Feldman has written, that's, I always call it my second Bible, but um, she wrote a book called, called Compassion, and it's, it's such a great book. Um, and she says, we're always beginners in the art of compassion. And I think every day that I wake up, I have to start again, you know, hopefully, I, and I do believe that I'm changed since I really tried to focus on compassion, that there's always something new, and there's going to be someone who's going to challenge my judgment. And, you know, the other thing I want to say about that is also not judging doesn't mean that I condone somebody's behavior, you know, because it can be very harmful. I mean, it can be, you know, terrible. Um, but but I respect that person deep down as being united with me. We are all one, you know, so I can't just shove that person out of out of my life. Um, so. So acceptance is the first seed, which leads us to then the second, which is? Yeah, the second one is nonviolence. And, you know, um, most people who want to be compassionate would not consider them to be violent. But as I started looking at my own life, and I looked at some of the thoughts I had about political leaders and, and politicians, and I thought, you know what? I, am, I, can, I can be violent in my mind. I can want bad things to happen to people. Um, and and so it's nonviolence is um, it's really nonviolence is an approach that says I do not wish you harm basically you know and and that's hard to do when when my feelings are raging or you know if I'm being judgmental so I think nonviolence again it's that deep respect that underneath everything you know we are one I cannot wish harm for you if I wish harm for you I wish harm for me you know, in some ways, so. Nonviolence yeah. is simply put, not wishing harm on yeah. other. And yeah. I say other selves, because I, I believe yeah. in this principle. Mm -hmm. In your book, you tell a story <laughs> about a activist who is being physically harmed and he chooses to accept that without retaliation, hoping yeah. that that hate and violence can die in his body. Could you yeah. speak a bit more about that? You know, I found that story so powerful, and it was um, it was a story about the time of the civil rights movement. You know, and and I just John Lewis is a congressman I've admired for years, and when he would write about you know coming in and sitting at a cafe and letting people spit on them and throw food at them and and not do anything, I thought how how could he do that? How could he not fight back? And and yet. They just kept at it and at it and at it. And finally things change. And that doesn't mean I think that we don't have action. You know, I think um, <clears throat> witnessing, you know, marching and that is very good, but it's not, they didn't do harm back to the other people. And that to me is just so powerful. And, and I think a lot is in our mind many times. Um, you know, not so much our physicality, although people can be physically abusive, but it's watching my mind. 
Where does my mind go? And it's something so simple as being on the freeway and some quote jerk <laughs> pulls in front of me and just about, you know, causes an accident. Just the other day, this person, this guy, that, oh, that reckless, ruthless person, you know, and then I got pull it back. No, Joyce, that person isn't being mindful. That person's in a hurry. What's the reason for it? You know, and, and then I, I, I can keep from being volatile within myself. So Joyce, thank you for sharing that recent story, because I, I think sometimes when we listen to someone as as compassionate as you, we think, oh, you know, we have so far to go and, and we're, we're nowhere near. But to hear you express like, yeah, even when I'm driving as, as of recently as, you know, last week, I still have to remind myself and that this is truly a practice and a skill mm -hmm. and a journey that is a daily work. So thank you for that. All right. Acceptance, nonviolence. And what's next? Forgiveness. Forgiveness is, again, it's just so core. Um, and you know, that's, I think that's one of the hardest, non-judgment certainly is very hard. So is not violence, but you know, forgiveness, because we have memories and we don't get rid of our memory. And so I know someone who, whose husband was, um, practicing alcoholic for years and it was a difficult, uh, relationship. And then he went into recovery and he was in recovery for a number of years and they had some good years together. And, you know, when he died, one of the things that really distraught her is that she would have these memories, these bad memories that would come back. And then that was a question, did I really forgive him? You know, but she did, but we can't keep memories from coming. And I think to, so for me, forgiveness is really an act of, uh, and again, it's kind of like non but an act of wanting to forgive. You know, I desire to forgive. Jack Cornfield has a, a beautiful chapter in his book on forgiveness. Um, and his book is called A Path with Heart. And he says, forgiveness is not wanting to put anyone ever out of your heart, which I thought, wow, <laughs> not wanting to put anyone out of your heart. Um, you know, Sharon Olds is a poet, and I I've often marveled at her because her her dad was a, abused her when she was a child and yet when he was dying sharon came and nursed him and was a, his caregiver during his final time before he died and i don't think she could have done that if she had not been forgiving you know she had those memories and um of the terrible years but she didn't want to put him out of her heart you know and so she did she did forgive you know so but that's a biggie for a lot of people. Absolutely. And our culture today, really, at least for, for us youngins, we, <laughs> we're taught, you know, cut them off, hit the black mm -hmm. button on social media, uh -huh. just, you know, just don't even deal with it. And relationships, particularly in this time when things are polarized around the pandemic and politics and, and other issues, even religion, yeah. it, it almost seems easier to just cut people off and not deal with it. But the truth is in our hearts, we don't wanna put people out of our hearts. Mm -hmm. I think how many loves can one heart hold? And yeah. I think there's no limit, there's no limit yeah. to that. So I, I really like that. And I think that makes forgiveness very accessible for even those of us mm -hmm. who may struggle with that concept. And that's so beautiful, Well, I love that. Just what you said, you know, how much love, can our hearts hold? It's endless. It's bound, bountiful, boundless. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. So acceptance, nonviolence, forgiveness, and that leads us to mindfulness. Can't be compassionate without being mindful. Wow. You know, and that whole thing, I think, is just what you were touching on, but our lives are filled with so much. And I think we have so many concerns and um, we're so, as Americans, especially, I think we're just constantly on, on the go and active in that, but to be aware of suffering, um, you know, so many times I've come into a conference or a workshop and people are smiling and they're happy and they're talking to each other. And especially if it's an extended, like our four day retreat, I find by the second day, people are starting to reveal the hurts, the pains, the burdens that they're carrying. And so it's how to be mindful of that. But even on a day-to-day on -to -day basis, like um, two days ago, I was at the post office and 
was mailing something and I didn't see the people behind me but I heard a woman's voice and it was just snarling and saying you 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 just are so rude you know and she just started this all of this and so I immediately became mindful of that and I I thought I want to say something to her like you know I, I, you must be having a difficult day and then I thought no Joyce that could be condescending saying you're having a bad day but I'm not you know kind of thing um, so I thought what can I do and I just turned to the, the whole compassion of being mindful of whatever was really difficult within her at that time to cause her to be so overactive and and then yeah, out of my mindfulness, I reached inside and I just started sending kindness and, and calmness to her. And it's so amazing because I did that because I was intentional and mindful. I can still, I can still hear her voice. I can still get a sense of her. And I feel like I could still send, you know, compassion to her because I was so intentional and attentional about it. So mindfulness, yeah, I think is, is we can't, can't be compassionate without being mindful of being aware of people's suffering, yeah. Yeah, I, I wanna know how you picked the four seeds, but what you just said sparked something else you mentioned in your book, which is really about being able to change the world even with our thoughts and kindness and mm -hmm. how we are truly connected with each other on a, a more than physical level. Could you share a bit about that? Oh, wow. Can I have three hours? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you know, uh, when I was in my 30s, I read something somewhere that once you got to about 35, your brain just sort of stopped. You know, you, that's it. You know, it didn't change or whatever. You were just stuck with who you were. And then, you know, neuroscience um, started opening up and they talked about neuroplasticity and how, yes, the brain can change and how we can change. And so I, I just, I love studying about that and learning about, you know, the part of the brain that's the, you know, the limbic, the carries the emotions and the instinctual part of us. And then the newer part of the brain, the neocortex and the frontal lobe. Because in the frontal lobe, which developed later in humans, that's where we can think, um, we can react, we can reflect, you know, we can um, look at differences and we can de make decisions. The instinctual part of us just instantly reacts. I think of the woman in the post office just immediately yelling at that person, you know, you're so rude. And, um, you know, if, if she had gone to the frontal cortex, just paused and just paused for a bit. Maybe she would have had a moment to say that, to think about maybe that person didn't mean that, or how can I respond in a way that isn't so, you know, overactive, you know, so, so, and, and what neuroscience is teaching is that the more that I, I repeat this kind of reflection, that I can change the way that I respond. And I know that's true for me. I know that my frontal lobe has gotten better <laughs> about that because, um, you know, there are times when I didn't, I just leapt, my words leapt out or I just let my emotions go. And sometimes with sorrow too, you know, but I had to stop and pause and, um, and reflect and say, you know, I'm not going to grieve forever. And then, you know, I can, I can pull back in that way too, or I can reflect more. So, so neuroscience, I think is in neuroplasticity is a really big thing. Uh, and so, and we teach that, um, we teach that in a way that our, the thoughts that go out from us, and uh, some of this is tied into quantum physics too, but the, the thoughts that go out from us have an effect you know, so if I'm constantly giving out anger and negativity and judgment and violent thoughts and that, that's going to go out and it's going to, it's going to affect another person. You know, one of the scientific things they studied is called mirror neurons. And that they studied first, you know, they studied with animals and they would like, they would give a monkey a banana over here and one cage and then the other monkey over there wouldn't have one, but they were, you know, they had this little, you know, head things on them at, to, to gauge their emotion, their, what their responses. And the monkey over here without the banana was going, thinking, experiencing the same thing that that monkey that was eating the banana. 
And so they called it mirror neurons that when, when we look at someone whose, whose emotion is there on their face, it responds within us. And I, when I would, I used to travel lots flying and I would always watch when I came on the flight attendant who welcomed us. It's a flight attendant was really happy and welcome aboard and all that. And I'd immediately start feeling good. But if that flight attendant was like, you know, get in your seats and sit down, we're late and we need to get going. I would start feeling like, wow, what a grouch, you know, and I didn't, didn't want to, you know, respond back in any kind of a kind way. Um, so mirror neurons are also like just again that's that mindfulness being aware of how i am the other person is looking and what i'm taking in um do i have time to talk about quantum physics a little bit well absolutely yes please well you know quantum physics along with neuroscience has has helped me so much with compassion and and I like it because it isn't just from quote the moral or scriptural viewpoint. It's the saying that we have many, many ways to assist us to be compassionate. And quantum physics, and I'm not, I'm not a physicist, but um, in studying um, the relationship between the two, what I learned is that um, that quantum physics is teaching has has certainly learned that we are all composed of these subatomic particles they call them particles or waves and they're always in motion they're always moving and the wonderful thing is that, that these all of us are every living thing and is composed of of these um from a you know, little atom to a tree to to everything living um so for human beings um and we're composed of these photons, which are light and heat particles, that they can resonate with each other and, and they can become in sync with each other. They can become entrained, you know. And, and so when I am with another person, depending how I am with that person, I can become entrained. I can become in sync, you know, that I can connect with them in a way that's positive, you know. Um, and I don't know if I wrote about this, and I think this happened after I wrote the book, but I was at a, one of my powerful experiences of this. I was at a, a memorial for when at Christchurch, New Zealand had a terrorist attack, and we had a big memorial service here in Des Moines, and I went, I went to that, and the, the church was packed, and so there were a lot of speakers lined up from ecumenical different religions, and they were getting, and from the community at large and people were getting up and talking for three or five minutes and you could tell there was a heaviness in the church and kind of a just I don't know almost a stone-like sort of uh, energy so all of a sudden one of our rabbis got up to speak and he just said a couple little words about our interconnectedness and he started singing that song lean on me and I'm not kidding you within 20 seconds, everybody was singing lean on me because we all, most of us were older. We all knew the words to that song. And when we finished, I, I felt this clearing space in me and I felt so united with the people around me. It was like the energy in that building changed completely. Um, you know, those subatomic particles of us, those photons we are, it was like suddenly we all settled in and we we were we were resonating, we were in training with one another. Um, and I, th I think that happens when we, when I can let go of, of some of my own, you know, thoughts, feelings, all of that, get rid of that filtering out stuff and, you know, just be present, be present to the other person. Um, as a compassionate presence. And I think that synchronous or that sinking and that in training can happen. So what you're sharing is really the, the truth that we are energy, that we are spirit yes. and our yes. physical bodies, even science is telling us it's not physical, it's not solid in the way that we've thought about it mm -hmm. and how we even think impacts the entire world these ripples are able to go much further than our physical presence goes so thank you for sharing that and taking time for that i, I want to hear more though how did you come to be open 
to even hearing this type of information because mm -hmm. in my experience sometimes this can can sound a bit overwhelming or uh, i'm not going to deal with that that that's not really what i know yeah. how did you yeah. become open to to expansion in this way yeah wow that's such a good question well um you know i've always i've always wanted my world to be a big world not a small world and so i've i've loved meeting people i've I've really appreciated um, material from different traditions that would enrich my life and help me to be become a better person, more true person that I am. Um, and Joyce, so, I'm sorry, I've got to interrupt on that one. Yeah. You said become a better person, then you kind of went back and said more true. I yeah. think that's beautiful. More, I, I want to be more true. Okay, yes. I'm sorry. Please yeah. continue. Thank that was yeah. Sorry. yeah, thank you. Because that is what I believe. Because we are our true self. We just need to keep discovering it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I, I pretty much had an openness a good portion of my life. Although I will pause and say, but not with everything and everyone. Because as soon as I say that, I think, but Joyce, how open are you to very traditional conservative religious right people who think everything they say, who, who aren't how open am i to people who aren't open that's how i would put it you know it's not just conservatism religious right whatever strong religious right we need conservative people um so but i i really i i just you know and i truly i i credit spirit i i i am so i so believe in daily discernment and um Every morning, you know, my my name for the divine presence is Sophia, the holy wisdom. And so every morning I I just ask Sophia to guide me through the day to be the most loving person that I can be. And um, so I, you know, I can't credit myself with that really, but I really credit this movement of the divine in my life and just nudging and urging me always to something more. And uh, I, every day I say, I'm thankful. I'm just thankful for, you know, what has come. But I do understand people that can be fearful. Like I've had people who've walked out of my conferences because I talked about Buddhism, for instance, you know, and they're just really afraid of it. Oh no, that's, you know, they don't believe in a God and so on and go, no, look for what unites us, not for what might divide us. And if I can look for what unites us, there is so much that unites us. You know, our common humanity that so many people in compassion write about now, you know, we, you know, our immigrants, the strangers that are, we, we have a commonness with them. And, um, and I, I want to, I want to remember that. So I don't know if that's a good answer or not, but that's what I have right now. <laughs> Fantastic answer. And it reminds me of a quote from your book where and I'm paraphrasing, but you say that compassion dismantles anything that's exclusive. And yeah. so I think that that's what you're speaking to there is, well, we may not see this the same way, but because of compassion, we're not creating barriers where we're creating bridges. So I think that's beautiful. And I want to talk about how this is being developed because you have a facilitator model and all of that to expand this work. But before we get there, how are you maintaining hope in the world today? Um, um, wow, there's so many ways um, that I have hope. You know, I just finished Jane Goodall, um, Douglas Abrams interviewed her in a book called a, uh, a Book of Hope. Jane Goodall, you know, the primatologist has been a mentor of hope for me in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, and what she says, and I agree with her completely, is her hope is in the young people of the world today. So that's that's one area. Um, Paul Hawken, I've long uh, quoted him because Paul Hawken, quite some guys could be but dozen years ago now, he started studying all the groups in the world, all around the globe that are working toward good. And he came up with over a million. That was like 12 years ago. And he continues to talk about that. And he says, you know, these are people that oftentimes they're flying under the radar, but they're there and they, they want, you know, they want to be compassionate. They want good for our, our planet and for the people and the creatures and, and all of our planet that are there. So that's certainly a hope of mine. Um, and, you know, I hope because I, 
every day I am in touch with people who write to me, who I, I meet in person, who are so caring and so loving. And you and I both know the news doesn't carry much of that for us. You know, it's always a little exception at the end of the central news feed. And, um, and so I, I have a lot of hope. And, uh, and I, I also hope because there are many groups that are studying compassion right now. Um, and, you know, the more we know about them, I think the more we have kinship and strength in that too. So those are a couple of ways. One question I, I try to throw in, and this is our, our third season of our podcast, where we're really seeking to amplify hope. But one question I like to ask, at least this season, is what are you listening to that's inspiring you? What music is giving you hope? Ah, wow. Well, you know, I, I like almost all kinds of music, okay? So, but the music of the heart might be one thing <laughs> as well as, you know, actual music. But um, I, I'm trying to think of what music I'm listening to. You know, Carrie Newcomer is someone whose music I've, I've listened to a lot lately. I like, uh, there's a lot of hope in her music. Sarah Thompson, I mentioned her. Um, I'm kind of a classical music buff. And so I go on Spotify and I just always try to find somebody new that, that I haven't known about before. Music is so central to my life. I cannot imagine a day without music of some kind, you know. Um, but music of the heart, too. I think joy is so important to keep in our lives, keep in my life. And so finding something of joy every day. And you know, before I go to sleep at night, what was there about joy in my day? And even the most miserable day, I can usually find something of joy in it. So, yeah, good question. Joy is one of my favorite words. And thank you. It's uh, for the holiday season. I Some people may say it's overboard. I say it's just enough. But like, <laughs> my entire home is filled with just sparkle and glitter and joy, joy, joy. Oh, because I try to carry that with me through throughout yeah. the entire year. Just yeah. the season of giving and of mm -hmm. common humanity. So I love that. We've still got about 250 people on. So that means they're they're really appreciating what you're saying. And I know that they're wondering, how do I get involved? How can I do this work in my communities, in my sphere of influence? How can I take this boundless compassion into my community? Uh, thank you, Will. Um, you know, about five years ago, I realized that I couldn't do this boundless compassion all by myself. And, and Margaret Stratman, who was co-director, we just had so many people who wanted re retreats and workshops. And, and so... Um, we, we decided we were going to start training people that were interested to facilitate the program. And it has been absolutely gratifying, amazing, so many words. Um, we have about 125 facilitators right now across the country and in Canada, a couple right. in the UK. Um, and um, so, you know, we have, they go to a four day retreat on compassion, and then we have a workshop that follows with some more specific things. And I am so excited because we finally, as of yesterday, got our new Boundless Compassion website up and running, and it's called Compassion boundlesscompassion.org. It is beautiful. And it talks about the four seeds of compassion, um, it has things about our facilitation program. Uh, it's we're going to keep adding to it, but there's it's just it's so good, and it, and it gives events. It will list events that people can take part in, and we'll keep adding to those events too. So, uh, but you know, people can do compassion wherever they are. Will that's the wonderful thing, and. Um, a lot of people are doing a book study, you know, they might start with my book, Boundless Compassion, and then they'll go on to other books on compassion. And so there are a lot of people that do circles of compassion now and, um, you know, monthly groups where they meet and support one another with compassion. So with um, wanting to be compassionate. So that's, that's just briefly what that is. So perfect. And that website again is boundlesscompassion.org. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, I, I know you're going to have a lot of traffic there, so we'll be ready for it. Yeah, I think we will be. Yeah, thank you. Joyce, this has been beyond a pleasure. It has been uplifting and inspiring, hope inspiring. And just I appreciate 
every story you shared, every seed of compassion that you've provided us to work with. I want to invite uh, our gracious host, Shana, back on and uh, just take it away. Well, thank you so much, both of you. What a beautiful time together. And we do have a little time we'll spend in Q&A. But first, I'd like to give everyone an opportunity. You've listened with the ear of your heart today. What is it that you've heard? What is it that you know about compassion? So if you would, um, if you take a moment and use our chat box function to answer the prompt, what is compassion? And I'm going to read that in sort of a... Maybe we'll come up with a poem or something or some type of uh, just a reflection of what everybody heard today um, and what compassion means to you. And in the meantime, I'd also just like to point out some of the people who joined us today. I don't know if I saw all of our board members, but I'd like to thank Mary Alice Nielsen. She is our board president. Um, we have uh, Michael Buckley. Um, Bill Terry, um, and I think uh, Terry Murphy was joining. Uh, she may be under the name Shauna Walsh, a lot of you were, uh, and Delise Sartini. Um, I'd also like to thank some of our spiritual directors. I saw Lynn Rosencrantz, um, Linda Turner, uh, Kathy Rood, uh, Jane Franzioli, who's a member and a, and a uh, spiritual director locally, uh, Ken Larson, also a spiritual director. So I've got a lot of spiritual directors if you're looking for someone in the Las Vegas Valley or if you want to join one of them um, via FaceTime or Zoom. Um, gosh, there were just so many other people. From Dignity Health, we had Holly Lyman, and she is Compassion in Action. They're taking programs to the underserved at every moment, every day. Uh, we have Mary Lack. She is from the Adrian Dominican community and runs their associate program, growing a, a tremendously large um, a just community of compassion for the Adrian Dominican sisters. Um, so thank you. And uh, I'm just gonna write down a few of these as you keep writing in. Um, I'm also going to invite you to take a moment, if you would like, um, to ask Will or Joyce a question in the chat box. And they're going to take a few minutes to try to answer those. And um, in the time we have remaining. So, um, So a few things we heard today, compassion is understanding. It's an awareness of suffering. It's a triple A, awareness, attitude, and action. Compassion is an inner posture. It's a daily practice and a form of prayer. It is love. Compassion is nonviolent mind. It is responding with kindness. It is always possible. Compassion is to walk a mile in my moccasins. Compassion is love. Thank you for you. Um, that's just a few of the ones we had today that I could capture. And I would love if you would now take a moment to, to um, send us your questions. I'm gonna share this, to bo this question to both Will and Joyce. When I realize that I am not compassionate in this situation, I feel sad and fall into a guilt trap. What are your suggestions? You know, uh, something we have not talked about is, am I on for now? Okay. Something we have not spoken about, which is major, is self-compassion. And, you know, when guilt comes up, I think the first thing, first question is, how compassionate am I being toward myself? And so just as I um, try to understand where other people are coming from, I need to understand where I'm coming from. And uh, it doesn't mean again that I excuse myself, but rather that I, I am with myself in a kind way, you know? And I, I don't think 
feeling guilty about myself and shoving myself around is, is being kind. I wouldn't do that to someone else. So I, I wouldn't want to do that to myself. So I know, Will, what would you add on to that? You know, self-compassion is such a biggie right now. Self-compassion is key for mm -hmm. sure. And I, I would start with recognizing I feel sad as a good thing. Greeting that emotion is, wow, mm -hmm. I'm human. I'm compassionate. Yay. Yeah. And then recognizing it as an opportunity. Every new day is an opportunity to grow. And as you said, become more true. And mm -hmm. so I, I would keep that in mind. And just as you mentioned, ask yourself the question, is this how I would want to talk to someone else? Would I have friends if I spoke to them in this way? Mm -hmm. And then choose kindness and replace those words of despair or, or um, inadequacy with words of positivity and uplifting for yourself. So mm -hmm. instead of I'm a failure, I have great opportunities. Just, just trying something as simple as that so that you change your inner dialogue as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I think too, uh, along with that, which is one, I loved your response. Um, I, I think, you know, just really talking to ourselves and saying, you know, how can I help you with this? You know, what, what, would, what would be something we could do together that would help alleviate some of the suffering, the suffering of guilt that you're feeling now? You know, what are the steps we can take? So being a good friend to ourselves. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Great question. We had two right. questions, and I think there was a question that you, you answered this question mm -hmm. a little bit earlier, but um, maybe we can look at it this way. Someone asked the question, are we born to be compassionate? And someone else asked the question, why aren't there enough compassionate people in the world today? And I wonder, is there times in history where it seems more compassionate or there's more that 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 feeling of compassion is more there in, in our young people and um if if that just creates more and more compassionate people how would you answer that actually there studies have been done that show that there are there's much more compassion today than there's been in the past um which might be surprising but um, as I was saying earlier, there's a lot going on that it just isn't, isn't out there in the open. And, um, you know, so compassion is about relationships, really. And, you know, there are pe people really do care. And when we have, I mean, we just look around recently, we, I mean, we're constantly having natural disasters now. And how people respond, they're responding positively. People do care. Um, I just think that we have so gotten so caught up in verbal differences that we think we aren't compassionate, but we truly are. And, and I think there's a lot of acts of compassion that are happening. Yes, there's, there's, there's um, activity that's going against compassion too. There always will be, I think, when there's a pull towards something good, there's a pull away from it. Um, but I tend, to, I, I tend to feel very positive about that. And again, compassion begins with myself. So if I'm sending out loving kindness and, and loving thoughts, then I know I'm contributing to compassion in the world, as well as being with people who are suffering. Will, I'd love to know what you, your thoughts are about that. Yeah, I, I have a ton. And uh, forgive me if this is not in, in boundless compassion, but I, I think it is uh, a story about birds and milk and how they were learning to open the milk pack. This is, you know, when they came to the door and glass, but birds would learn how to open that milk and drink the cream out. And over time, birds that were miles away began doing the same thing. Milk went away. Five years later, milk comes back and the birds do it again. And these birds didn't live the whole five years. It was just something that had become a part of their, their spiritual DNA, for lack of a better mm -hmm. term. And I think that's yeah. what's happening with compassion. Even some of the challenges we are facing where it seems as if we're polarized and not hearing each other and just, just so divided. For me, that says we are so compassionate because mm -hmm. on every side, every perspective is saying, I wanna alleviate suffering. 
And we have different information, different vantage points, different viewpoints on what's causing suffering. But the thing of the matter is, we're all trying really, really hard to alleviate that suffering, which for me is the spirit of compassion. So as, as difficult as this time is, I am also daily inspired by just the amount of compassion in the world. Well, you are such a wise person. I just love that. And I'm so glad you brought it up because that's another scientific uh, aspect that really feeds into compassion. And um, that that is, it's called morphogenic fields. And it, that field is a non-material sphere, you know, of, of, it's a sphere of influence. And the more that that practice happens, as you said, the more firm and strong it's going to become and the more influential. You know, I just read a story Oh, it was sometime this year, and I don't remember exactly where. I think it's from was in New England, but they actually they were studying the migration of butterflies, and mm -hmm. they found that when the butterflies were flying at this one place, I think it was someplace in New England, they were flying straight, but they would they would veer and they'd go around, but there was nothing material there that they were going around, and so after they someone studied this for a long time, they found out there was actually long ago an obstacle where those butterflies were flying toward. It wasn't there anymore, but they had done it so often that they it was in their DNA and they naturally moved to go around it. I just love that story because I think it's so true for us. If every compassionate act is going to strengthen that morphogenic field of compassion. And I, so I'm so glad you brought that up. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That was one of my, my favorite pieces in there. And so right now I have three generations in my home, my myself and my husband, and then my mother and then her parents. Mm -hmm. And it was so funny yeah. because they're from Detroit and they've been with us since the, the start of December. So when we take out the trash and do different things, they have certain habits they've developed because mm -hmm. Michigan, you have to do certain things in order for, for your trash not to be eaten by like raccoons and squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> and like we don't have to wrap it we just put it in the can and that's it because we don't have that here but it's, it's that that habit and taking taking your practices into a new context where sometimes sometimes it's helpful but sometimes you don't have to do that anymore and it's like why do you do it this way because well, we've always done it that way but we can shift that and change and advance and evolve it's a good example too i think of retraining the brain you know, remembering and retraining um, on many levels. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we had a question from uh, a viewer named Janet and she was talking about politics and how is it that we make or how do we bring more compassion into the political process? And do you see um, more politicians um, maybe taking advantage of compassionate training programs? I'll feel that to both of you. <laughs> wow. Well, you know, we, wouldn't it be wonderful? I think we would have a changed society if every congressperson or every every politician would take a boundless compassion, be open to take boundless compassion retreat or conference or whatever. Um, that, that's not going to happen, obviously. But, you know, again, I, I say it begins with myself and if I can, instead of just being angry about something that is or isn't happening, if I can change my heart enough to, to go beneath the surface again, you know, and, and to trust that that person, if they get below whatever is leading them to speak and act or not act the way they are, that they want the best interest for themselves and for others. Maybe it's gotten clouded and covered up, but it's there someplace. And if I just keep pushing against it, it's not going to change, you know? So I want to be open. And I do believe that listening to one another is so vital. I have to listen to people that think very differently than I do and not get defensive about it. I just need to hear them. I need to hear, why is it that you prefer not wearing a mask or not being vaccinated? Or why, you, why are you so against certain people coming into our country or whatever it is? I've got to listen to that and not just close the door and say, 
what you just not of my group you know um i i think listening is is so is so vital um to to where different people are coming from so will yeah thanks joyce and i i agree i echo all of that listening is is key and one thing that i love about compassion is it allows us to hear as well and it makes it more clear because we can listen or, or attempt to hear and sometimes misinterpret also our context the exact same word for us can mean something different mm -hmm. compassion is one of those words a, a lot of people interpret that as soft or fuzzy or right. it means you just let anything go there's no mm -hmm. accountability whereas when i hear compassion i'm like oh that's that's some work that's a 500 pound <laughs> barbell right. you know <laughs> so um, yeah. i, I want to add that politics is hard uh, if you've ever even tried to plan like a family reunion or heck a, a ordering a pizza for a family of five like what toppings are we getting yeah. that can be so so tough and so a, a politician has to consider the interest of everyone that that individual represents and sometimes those interests can appear to be in conflict. And how do you balance that? How do you navigate it? So my ask of every person on this, this uh, event today is that you take a moment and send gratitude to every single one of your elected officials. Just mm -hmm. from your heart, if you're moved to write a letter mm -hmm. or an email, do that as well. But it's a thankless job and it's hard. And yes, there are some politicians that have been corrupted and are corrupt. I will not deny that. But most people get into politics because they want to make a difference right. and because they want to help. And the very system and structure itself is sometimes a bit tough to navigate to actually create help because of the foundation that it was built on. So again, send gratitude for that. And then I encourage you to take it a step further and get involved, actually show yeah. up at your city council meeting or your school right. board meeting and voice your piece. If the meeting, I've been at some and they've just gotten out of hand with protesters and everything. And I'm just like, hey, can we all just take 30 seconds and breathe? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and just yeah. taking those breaths allow people to calm down. So you can do so much and have such an impact. And the last thing I'll say is another ask, which is run for office. There are so many offices that go uncontested. Mm -hmm. There's a space for compassionate people. Often we're not in politics because it is tough. It, it can be difficult. But the reason that we see a lot of the things we see is because people who believe in this aren't in the mix. So get involved, get in the mix and be heard. You know, well, I want to take that a step further. And I just so agree with you on every single thing that you said. You know, what I have found, especially as a speaker in the last five years, is that we're very hard on one another. We don't give each other a lot of space as, as Americans. And we are very demand. And I say we we're, we're, as, a, as a culture, we're very demanding, I think. And um, and so I really like that what you said about sending a note of gratitude you know, um, how, how important, well, what would that feel like for a person to receive thanks, you know, um, thanks that, you know, I wonder how you started out, how you are, you know, anyhow, just the whole thing of sending thanks. But I think pulling back from, again, immediate judgment, and it has to be my way or no way. And, and then, like you say, the verbal attacks that get in there and all of that. And, um, just stepping back and observing. And, and one other thing I'd like to say that, Shauna, that you mentioned earlier is um, that phrase that's often used, you know, walk in my moccasins or walk in my shoes. You know, we cannot do that. It's just not possible to really get into what another person thinks and feels and experiences. I don't think we can walk in another person's shoes, but we can walk alongside of them. And we can ask them, how is it to walk in your shoes? And, you know, how tight are your shoes? How big are your shoes? Whatever it is. But um, I, don't, I don't think we can. We cannot. And I think people make the mistake that I, th I know what you think. I know how you feel. We, we can't do that. And, and so um, I much prefer the image of walking alongside than trying to walk in someone else's space. So I just wanted, wanted to add that. So. I'm going to 
just take time for two more questions. And I also, I noticed somebody in my chat block, I want, I want to thank Krista Darnold. She is also with um, Compassionate Las Vegas. She has joined us today. And I think she's uh, shared one of her favorite songs for everyone to hear. Oh no, she said she shared it with me. So um, maybe I'll share that with you in our after event email, which you will receive next week. Um, so, the two other questions, and I'll pose them together, and, and I know that you've answered this in one way or another um, already, but maybe we can sum it up with these. Um, one question was, uh, how do we, when we are being compassionate, what if someone sees that as an opportunity to take advantage? Mm -hmm. Where, what what is the correct response or what are the boundaries or how do you discern how to um, move forward still in a loving way with that person? And the second one I think is interesting because we have Will here as our host today and um, as the spokesperson for Compassionate Las Vegas. And there's a question of the, the male to female ratio on this topic today of compassion and um, what we see how we respond to that and um, what you may be seeing taking place that that maybe we're not aware of yet about the um, are more males getting involved or you know what's that ratio and um, so two questions the first was how do we respond um, when someone's taking advantage or it, we perceive they're taking advantage and then second um, the question of are women just more interested in compassion or, or is it just that we're more drawn to the conversation well, I'll just, I'll do something with it. Joyce, I'd love for you to close this out. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Sure. All right, perfect. Um, I'll start with the second question first as well. There are a lot of compassionate men. In fact, Compassionate Las Vegas, the visionary is a man. And so this is something that does transcend gender. But culturally, this, this value of compassion is seen as something more feminine or soft. And men are told, you have to be protectors and warriors and providers, whereas, and I'm talking traditional roles, the, the feminine is told to be nurturing and supportive and compassionate. And so it's just transforming the viewpoint of compassion, I think, to engage more men. Just as a percentage, I, I can't say this is true everywhere, but our organization is only about 20% male. And so there is a huge opportunity to increase that diversity in that way. Uh, as far as the taking advantage piece, you know, this one takes me back to my teacher, who is Jesus. And he, he has so many great, great sayings around this. But one that sticks out for me right now is if someone asks you to walk them out with them, walk with them too. If they ask for your shirt, give them your, your coat also. And I'm just paraphrasing, but I, I don't think that compassion can be taken advantage of. If you're truly trying to seek to alleviate the suffering of others, then sometimes it's, it's going to feel a bit uh, stretchy for you. You'll have to expand your comfort zone and go further than you thought. But in the end, that's an advantage for you because now you've had that experience and your capacity to give, your capacity to be compassionate is expanded. Uh, one little asterisk or caveat on that, Compassion does have accountability. And it, it there's a, a quote by Brene Brown that I love, which says, clear is kind. And so if we're truly being compassionate, then we do have accountability and we are direct and we do say what we mean. We say it with love and kindness, but we don't uh, cover it up. We don't twist it and make it untrue to save someone's feelings. We, we do it with their feelings and consideration. But sometimes we need to hear something hard in order to, to see. I'll never forget, I was my first supervisory role. I was applying for a manager position. And the director said to me, OK, well, you were second. And I'm sitting there smiling. Oh, great. I feel so good. I'm a young kid. And I'm like, yeah, I was second in line to be, to be manager now. And she looks at me completely straight face. That wasn't a good thing. And I said, whoa. OK, and she explained to me, you know, why and everything. But that moment has always resonated with me and stuck with me because she was honest and she was straightforward and told me the things I needed to work on. So um, I'll leave it there for for sake of time. But Joyce, I can't wait to hear your response. Um, 
Well, you know, the first thing I was going to say was similar to your one about getting clarity. If I felt like someone was taking advantage of me, I would talk to them about it. And I would, I would, I think it would be important to have a conversation about it. Um, and I, what triggered for me uh, in my mind was um, when you were speaking is, you know, we, we started out with this the Christianity and, and compassion and, you know, what does it mean to lay down our lives for another? You know, compassion is going to cost us. There's no doubt about it. And, um, and it, it, it often costs. And one of the hardest costs for me is my time, my precious time, you know, to be with someone else. And, and then those four seeds, every one of those is costly in some way when I'm, I'm really trying to be true to who I am. And, and to be compassionate. So I think so I think there's that dimension. But also, there is a time when we need to we need to just stand back and be separate. We, and I go back to self-compassion. Sometimes we need to have space and time apart. I just I believe that. And and so going back to that, am I am I okay with that person in my heart but for a while do I need to have some physical space or some distance I might I might need to have that um, but in the end you know I think just to say that compassion compassion is going to cost me and there's it's not as you said so well will compassion isn't this soft lovey-dovey sweet little thing that you're always going to feel good about you know oh now I'm doing this no it's it's um it's a posture, it's a way of life, and, and it will be challenging for us at times, but it is so worth it. It is so worth it. And I have met so many tremendous compassionate people. Trust me, there's good reason to have hope in our world today. Wonderful. Um, I do want to point out that Will mentioned that uh, the visionary for Compassionate Las Vegas is a male, and I don't know if he's here today because so many people are named Shauna Walsh and their cameras aren't on, um, but it is another uh, Still Point board member, Gar Jameson, and he has people from the Charter for Compassion, the larger international entity at his home today, so I think they're in, in retreat, um, but... Uh, Thank you to Guard and to Will for helping sponsor today. Um, as we close out first, thank you so much. And um, as we begin, uh, I'd love to give everybody a chance to check out together. And um, what we're going to do is take another few seconds of contemplative, um, contemplative silence. And during that time, um, a Still Point board member, a spiritual director, and a member of the Boundless Compassion uh, core team, Ken Larson, is going to read a paraphrase of um, Joyce's prayer, Seeds of Compassion. And as he does that, I am going to click in the chat, Still Point Center for Development's um, website, as well as the website for Boundless Compassion, because there were some questions of how to get involved and what a facilitator might do. And I don't think we have time to answer that today, but you can connect with Boundless Compassion that way. I wanna thank you all. Uh, thank you so much for giving us your time today. And now, um, if you would, if you take a moment to take a deep breath, lower your gaze, and we're gonna hear from Ken. Thank you, Shauna. Gardener of hearts, I turn to you today for encouragement and determination in activating the seeds of compassion that have been planted in my being. Seed of empathy. Seed of solidarity. Seed of non-judgment. Seed of forgiveness. Seed of kindness. Seed of just anger. Seed of patience. Seed of sympathy. Seed of love.
enable me to love as fully as I can, nurtured by your abiding companionship. Surround and fill my heart with what I need in order to be a compassionate presence. Thank you again, Joyce. Thank you again, Will. Thank you, Ken. And I'd like to thank all of you for being here. And I'd like to give a special thank you um, because she's the one person at Still Point I haven't mentioned yet, uh, Julia Pizzi. Um, she is our hospitality coordinator and the woman who makes sure that Joyce's books are on my desk to read if I need to be reading them. Um, uh, she's a wealth of knowledge uh, and of help to me. Um, we welcome you all to Still Point Center of uh, for spiritual development in Las Vegas. Uh, you can join us online, in person, from wherever, whenever. Um, please visit our website to learn more and have a compassionate day. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm.